History as it happens, March 23rd, 2023. The Iraq War, Part 2. And they will welcome as liberators the United States. This is the moment Iraqi journalist Mantaza al Zaidi held his shoes at President George W. Bush. Clearly are viewed as liberators by the vast majority of the Iraqi people. No question we've had problems with a group of terrorist insurgents, but that's a very small minority. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. Does Al-Qaeda have bases in Iraq? Part of this site was our Cowie network in Baghdad, our two dozen Egyptian Islamic Jihad, which is indistinguishable from Al-Qaeda. Transition from dictatorship to democracy will take time. 20 years after U.S. forces were supposed to be greeted as liberators, a generation after democracy building began in Iraq. Iraq is not a democracy. It's a Shia autocracy allied with Iran, where corruption reigns, where America's dreams are buried in mass graves. Almost no one has been held accountable for two decades of failure and misery, where journalist Gaith Abdul Ahad witnessed it all. Occupation, civil war, the rise of ISIS, and more. And he's next as we report history as it happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. Saddam is dangerous. The world would be a better place without him. But the reason he poses a growing danger to the United States and its allies is that he possesses chemical and biological weapons and is seeking with his $2 billion a year illegally skimmed from the UN fund for food, his oil for food program, for peace program, that he is seeking nuclear weapons. Now that conflict has come, The only way to limit its duration is to apply decisive force. And I assure you, this will not be a campaign of half measures, and we will accept no outcome but victory. On February 25th, 2003, about a month before U.S. soldiers invaded Iraq, Army Chief of Staff General Eric Shinseki testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee. He was asked by Senator Carl Levin how many troops would it take to stabilize Iraq after toppling Saddam. And his answer angered the neocons in the Bush administration. Something on the order of several hundred thousand uh, soldiers are, are, are probably uh, you know, a figure that uh, would be uh, required. Uh, we're talking about post-hostilities, control over a a piece of geography that's uh, fairly significant with uh, uh, the kinds of ethnic tensions that could lead to uh, uh, other uh, problems. And so it takes a significant ground force presence. Several hundred thousand soldiers, he said. Well, two days later, Assistant Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, in testimony on Capitol Hill, corrected or uh, embarrassed the general. And I am reluctant to try to predict anything about what the cost of a possible conflict in Iraq would be or what the possible cost of reconstructing and stabilizing that country afterwards might be. But some of the higher-end predictions that we have been hearing recently, such as the notion that it will take several hundred thousand U.S. troops to provide stability in post-Saddam Iraq, are wildly off the mark. As historian Melvin Leffler writes in his new book, Confronting Saddam Hussein, Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, and key military leaders, among others, believe they could knock out the regime with a relatively small force and then get out. They were not interested in keeping the peace or nation building. They wanted to leave Iraq to the Iraqis as quickly as possible. Well, we know it didn't quite work out that way, and it took until 2011 for the U.S. to leave. Today, I can say that our troops in Iraq will definitely be home for the holidays. But President Obama would send U.S. forces back a couple years later to help the Iraqi government defeat ISIS, which had taken over Mosul and large swaths of territory in Iraq and Syria. And there are still 2,500 U.S. military personnel in Iraq today. Whether things might have turned out better had more U.S. troops been available in 2003 is not an unimportant point. But it, like many of the lingering debates about the conduct of the war, obscures the far more important issue. 
The war was unnecessary. Saddam Hussein was not a threat to the United States, and the idea that Iraq would blossom into a stable democracy was an illusion. And so was the idea that democracy in Iraq could lead to democracy elsewhere in the Middle East, an illusion CIA Director George Tenet seemed to subscribe to about a month before the war began in testimony on Capitol Hill. An Iraq that has, whose territorial integrity has been maintained, that's up and running and functioning, um, that is seen to be functioning in a different manner outside of the outside of the rubric of a brutal regime, may actually have some salutary impact across the region. But every country's different, and everybody's got different views about their own internal situation. Uh, but it, it may well create some dynamic and interesting forces that, quite frankly, I can't predict to you. But there may be some positive things that come out of it. Iraq's territorial integrity disintegrated the moment the regime fell, and the U.S. military presence catalyzed the insurgency. Largely absent from retrospectives on the war are Iraqi voices. It's as if they are invisible in a drama that primarily features stories about how the war hurt us, not them. Gaith Abdul Ahad was an architect living in Baghdad when the war broke out. Today, he is a journalist for The Guardian and the author of A Stranger in Your Own City, Travels in the Middle East's Long War, a superb reporter's account of the war through Iraqi eyes. In fact, there are no U.S. voices in its 400 or so pages. I don't often recommend books here, but I am recommending this one. Gaith Abdul Ahad joins us from London. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Your book was remarkable. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for all the work you've done bringing the horrors of war to light. It was not an easy read, not because it wasn't beautifully written. It was. It's because what you and your country have been through over the past 20 years is really difficult to take from the perspective of a U.S. citizen, me, who feels, how should I say this, a degree of guilt for what my country did to yours. But I only witness these events from a distance. You live through them, you cover them. So I must assume this was a difficult book to write. It was very difficult. It was was supposed to, you know, it was 14 years in the making and uh, about a war that's been going on for 20 years. And not over. Yet. And not over, of course. The conflict is still going on in Baghdad in a different form, in a different shape. But the repercussions of that moment in history still being felt in Baghdad at the moment. So we will circle back to what's going on in Baghdad and Iraq today. I want to start at the beginning for you. You were an architect, not a journalist, when the U.S. began threatening to go to war. And then you became a journalist. You started working as a translator and then a photographer. I guess you never expected you'd get caught up in in the war in this fashion, right? No, absolutely not. As you said, I was an architect. I loved architecture. I still love architecture. My dream was to be an architect. And and I never expected that one day I will be a journalist, a writer, let alone someone who would go from one conflict to another. You mentioned in the book how you were getting paid about $50 a month or something like that or whatever it was. You were living in a tiny red room. You didn't have a lot of prospects. You wanted to leave Iraq, but you couldn't because you were a military, considered a military deserter? Yes. So in Iraq, every male has to serve in the army. And I went there after university and I looked the way they were treating the soldiers, the young conscripts. And I just turned around and went back home. Spent five years dodging military service. I could do it then because the regime was weak. Because after many years of sanctions, the state was hollowed from inside. So I could survive. But of course, because of the sanctions, I was paid $50 every three months, actually, not every month. And I lived in a tiny little room. I wanted to leave the country. Uh, Like thousands, like hundreds of thousands of Iraqis who left Iraq. You know, I wanted to have a better life, better prospects, study, continue my studies, live like people want to usually live. But I couldn't. I failed. So I stayed in Iraq. We were both born in 1975 and we're both reporters. But I guess that ends what we share in common, right? Because I grew up in the suburbs of New York City. You grew up in Baghdad. And I probably hadn't heard of the Iran-Iraq war until, well, actually, I can't remember when I first learned about that. I wasn't paying attention to world affairs when when I was a teenager that much. Uh, But this was your experience as a child in Iraq, 1980s. 
It sounds like you and your family really didn't buy into the personality cult that Saddam Hussein and his regime tried to build up about that war and then what followed with the sanctions in the 1990s. So I don't think I've met any Iraqi who uh, brought up into the cult of personality of Saddam Hussein. People did work with the regime. People did benefit from the regime. But to respect the regime, to absorb this the mishmash of ideology and fiction that was the national narrative of Iraq, I doubt anyone did it. My childhood was boring as far as, you know, middle class childhood are boring. But the world strived to make it interesting. So, of course, when I was five, I, you know, I woke up one day to Iranian jet fighters bombing Baghdad. Eight years of war followed. People in Baghdad were distant from the war because we didn't live it. But the, the, the soldiers, the uncles, the cousins were conscripted. My father himself was conscripted to go to the army. Those people kind of witnessed the war. After that, there was a year of peace, and then Iraq invaded Kuwait, which led to the 1991 war. You call it the first Gulf War, we call it the second Gulf War. And that was followed by 13 years of sanctions, which literally destroyed the Iraqi society, the Iraqi economy. And, you know, of all the wars I've lived through, I think the sanctions had the biggest impact on my life and the lives of the people I know around me. Because that's when a society, a kind of a quasi-progressive society is crushed, you know, from zero illiteracy to, I don't know, 20, 30 percent high child mortality, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of children died because of the sanctions, because lack of medicine. I can go on talking about the sanctions for hours and hours. It's an overlooked aspect of the story here in the United States anyway. But the one moment I always think about when when I read about the sanctions is what the uh, U.S. Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, said in an interview on 60 Minutes. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. You know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. I assume that there must have been a lot of resentment, anti-American attitudes because of this in the country by 2002. So the Americans, when they came to Iraq in 2003, they didn't go to a country where they had no legacy with. They didn't have any shared history. We were fed the regime's narrative of America causing the sanctions, which they were in a way. So there's already this much resentment and hatred towards the United States. But people were found themselves in this Faustian deal. People hated Saddam. They wanted to get rid of Saddam. But at the same time, they didn't want war. They didn't want another American invasion. But what do we do? No one consulted us. No one asked us. So And the war happens. And we think, OK, fine. If the price of the war is to get rid of this bad dictator, then let's forget about the sanctions. Let's have a new start with the Americans. Because many Iraqis, you know, and I was talking to Iraqis earlier, even people in the army, people in Saddam's hometown, they were ready to get rid of Saddam because he was a mad dictator leading Iraq from one war to another war, from one invasion to another. And there was this kind of tiny little brief moment in which Iraqis were ready to forget about the sanction because they believed that America, this great super nation, will fix all the problems of Iraq within you know, a couple of months and Baghdad would be like Dubai. Hey, you mentioned it was something like it was an hour or maybe a day where everything seemed right. Saddam was gone, but the mayhem didn't quite begin. But it began maybe, well, as you said, about a day later when order broke down pretty much immediately, right? It, it happened really immediately. I mean, I talk about this one hour of freedom. Yes, an hour of freedom, that's between right. A, between a dictator and an invasion, an occupation. But, you know, when the Americans came to Iraq, the soldiers had no idea what to do. They were not given a plan. They were not told to secure. I mean, all occupying armies, the first thing they do is they impose a martial law and they occupy the city. That didn't happen partly because they didn't know what to do and partly because they didn't have enough numbers. And then suddenly you see these American soldiers standing in the middle of the road with all these equipments and machines and guns and and armored vehicles and the looting and the burning is taking place around them. And that looting, I mean, whatever was not destroyed in Iraq during the sanctions, whatever had survived, got destroyed during that looting process. The looting process also led to another issue, this lack of security. You know, the borders were wide open. So it was not only the destruction from inside. Anyone who had a grievance against the United States took advantage of this 
lack of security and flooded into the country. And I'm talking here about insurgents, Al-Qaeda, jihadis, you name it. They all came from as far as Afghanistan and Somalia. Suddenly, you know, one of the pretexts of toppling Saddam was because Saddam had dealing with Al-Qaeda, which was false, which was a lie. I mean, of course, Saddam was against any form of political Islam, any attempt to challenge his rule. But the irony is, the moment Saddam fell, Iraq became this hub for international jihadi movement. On one side, on the other side, uh, kind of regimes like the Syrians and the Iranians who were put on this axis of evil list, they also wanted the Americans to fail. And they worked very hard from early on to defeat the Americans in Iraq rather than wait for the Americans to come and, and fight them. So that lack of security, that early moment, basically sealed the fate of the American adventure, the occupation for years after. The lack of security, the looting, allowing other elements to enter the country. And of course, Iraqis lost faith in America in that moment. There was a debate in this country about how many troops would it take to stabilize a country the size of Iraq with Iraq's unique historical circumstances, the sectarianism, whatever, right? And the Army Chief of Staff, I believe was his uh, position at the time, General Eric Shinseki, testified before Congress that it would take hundreds of thousands of troops, and he was immediately contradicted by the Pentagon leadership in the Bush administration. It was two days later when Paul Wolfowitz testified. But some of the higher-end predictions that we have been hearing recently, such as the notion that it will take several hundred thousand U.S. troops to provide stability in post-Saddam Iraq, are wildly off the mark. So it was a double mistake, invading in the first place and then invading with, quote, only 150,000 or whatever troops it was. But I do remember sitting in a newsroom when I was 28 years old, so we were the same age, and I'm watching the statue of Saddam Hussein come down, and I'm looking at American soldiers as any American citizen would. They're the good guys. So I had to continue to remind myself as I read your book to see this through your eyes and through the eyes of ordinary Iraqis who are viewing our soldiers as occupiers, not as liberators. What do you have to say about that? You know, it was a very deliberate thing to write a book about 20 years of war and not include a single American voice in it. I mean, you see the Americans in the book, they are on the top of the tanks, they're manning checkpoints, they are there implementing whatever they were implementing. But I I thought this book is not about the Americans. There's so many books about American wars and the soldiers and the trauma of the soldiers. I think this is a book about Iraqis. So yes, we were trapped. And you know, the strange thing is, is you could look at the Americans as your soldiers and think of them as the good guys. But we Iraqis, we were caught in the middle. We were caught in the middle of an occupation and a bloody insurgency. So neither the Iraqis who were fighting the Americans were our people because they had a crazy ideology that we did not uh, subscribe to. No, the Americans were our people. So we were just kind of lost. And this is the same sense in Iraq 20 years later, that the people have been trapped between the Americans and the insurgency, now trapped between the Americans and the Iranians. It's this whole sense of entrapment that we were unable to get rid of before we were entrapped under Saddam and his regime. And then later we were trapped in this mad conflict between the Americans and the jihadis and the insurgents. You make a point in the closing pages of your book. Every regime that has ruled Iraq, whether it's outsiders or Iraqis, has never really tended to the needs of the people. So I do remember that one of the things that helped open my eyes to the folly of the war was the sheer chaos and violence that unfolded as the insurgency got underway. And at the time, though, it wasn't clear to me, although it is clear to me now, that one of the factors driving the insurgency was how many civilians the U.S. occupiers were killing in airstrikes and you know, other acts of violence, shooting people at checkpoints. Can you address that catalyst for the insurgency, just the sheer number of people who are being killed? So after this, the initial disaster of the lack of security, the second disaster was that when the Americans came to Iraq, they brought with them Iraqi exiles the so-called uh, London Conference. And they were dominated by Islamic parties, Shia Islamic parties who were in Iran in exile, Kurds and others. And the way they justified the war, that this was a war to liberate the majority of the people, the Shia, from the oppression of the Sunni. 
the narrative went like this, that because Saddam was a Sunni, then the regime was a Sunni. Then by association, all the Sunnis of Iraq are culprits in the crimes of the regime and the crimes of Saddam. And that was a disastrous plan because in Iraq, although there are Sunnis and Shia and Kurds and Christians and Turkmen and and you name it, the idea of a sectarian conflict did not exist. Iraqi society is a modern society, mostly, I wouldn't use the word secular, but religions, sectarian religion, sectarian identity did not play a role, especially in the last two, three years. Yes, Saddam was oppressing political Shia Islam parties, as well as he was oppressing Sunni political yeah. Islam. And, and so at the end of the day, anyone, Sunni and Shia are both Muslims. I mean, they share the same religion. And they're Muslim. And in the 90s or the 80s, you know, marriages intermarried in my childhood, in my high school class. I still don't know of the 40 kids who is a Sunni and who is a Shia. So that identity came after the occupation. So what happens if you have a victim? Then you need a victimizer. And the victimizers were the Sunnis. The Sunnis was pushed into a corner. They were purged from the state. They were purged from the army and security forces. And they were targeted in first verbally and then by policies and then military. So it's like a cycle, a Sunni village, let's say, would start fighting the Americans. Then the Americans or someone from that Sunni village will be targeting the Americans. The Americans will target the whole community. And then instead of a small cell of five or 10 people, you will have a hundred. And that went on and on until the cycle was broken by the Sunnis themselves around 2006, seven. That's right. That was the awakening movement, the so-called surge in the United States. So there was an internal Sunni struggle, but also Sunni versus Shia. And the way you describe it in your book, the killing spree just took on a life of its own. It became detached from the initial causes of the friction. Because what the Iraqi insurgency did is they did this deal with the jihadis. They thought if we ally ourselves with the jihadis who knew how to fight, who were more organized and who could attract funding from the Gulf region, if we ally ourselves with them, then we can defeat the Americans. But of course, the jihadis had a different plan, and their plan was to ignite a civil war. So the jihadis, rather than targeting the Americans, went on targeting the Shia communities. Which, of course, led to another reaction, a Sunni-Shia civil war, in which the majority of the Sunni civilians became targets, as much as the Shia families and the Shia civilians in their markets were targets of car bombs. That dynamic of the civil war led to the defeat of the Sunni, Iraqi Sunni insurgency by 2006-2007. I have Iraqi Sunni commanders who would tell me, we cannot fight the Shia militias and the Americans at the same time. We need to have a ceasefire with the Americans so that they will protect us from the Shia militias. And that was the dynamic that led to the awakening, which could have ended the Iraqi civil war back there in 2007, 2008. Enter the scene another character called Nur al-Maliki. Nur al-Maliki, who was a favorite of the Americans, who was the prime minister at the time. The Americans thought they could do business with him, but he had a sectarian mentality. He wanted to control the state security forces. He created the conditions that led to the second sectarian civil war, ISIS, and what followed. You're unsparing in your criticism of Nuri al-Maliki, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, who was a Shia autocrat. So the U.S. invasion turned Iraq, which was a Sunni secular dictatorship, and the counterbalance in the region to Shia Iran from an American geopolitical perspective, turned that into a Shia autocracy with ties to Iran. And the key point here, the the catalyst for all of this death and mayhem, was the U.S. imposing a sectarian framing over the new government after the fall of Saddam. So I have an issue here. I mean, Saddam was a Sunni, but it was not a Sunni secular state. A religion was always part of the state. I would call it a nationalist state led by a dictator surrounded by a circle of his close allies, which came from his region. Happened to be Sunni, yes, of course. But it was family clan rule over a state. A lot of the Ba'ath Party were from different parts of the country, Shia, Christians, even Kurds. A lot of the army was, you know, Shia, Kurd, Christian, and all these things. So it was not a Sunni rule per se. 
But what happened later, you're right, you're accurate. You turn Iraq, because of the sectarian politics you you brought with you, you turn Iraq into what it's Iraq now, the biggest ally of Iran, in which half of the parliament is dominated by militia commanders, in which Qasem Soleimani was probably the most influential general in Iraq, far more influential than the Americans. And this is... A strategic disaster. I mean, one of the issues that I keep talking about now, 20 years later, is accountability. So accountability towards the people who led the war. No one's been held accountable. Not Wolfowitz, not Rumsfeld. They either die in peace or they go to paint and become senior elder politicians. The fact that there is no accountability for the people who led the war the people who executed the war, the people who killed, murdered Iraqi civilians, be it foreign or be it Iraqi. 20 years later, none has been held accountable. And that is the huge thing for the Iraqi people. The same thing from a pure American national security perspective. You know, what did you achieve in this region? You, 20 years later, you turn Iran into the biggest political player in Iraq. That is you know, madness well, some from of the, a strategic point of view. Some of the architects of the war are still saying it worked or it was a mistake and it didn't go the way we planned, but today Iraq is better off. And I get angry when I see comments like that. You know, I guess it all goes back to Saddam Hussein was an SOB, but there's more to the picture than that. And, and about accountability, at the ground level, in interviews with Iraqis, they share with you how in their town or their city, there were hundreds upon hundreds of murders or kidnappings and no one was ever, because so much of it was done by the government or the militias, right? And here, from a U.S. perspective, I used to think I was nuts at one point when I believed, and I have to say, I still believe this, that some of my own leaders belong in prison because this was a crime. Martin, I was in Baghdad two weeks ago, 10 days ago, and I was writing a story about this very notorious militia commander. I mean, his name strikes fear in the heart of every single Iraqi, that yours truly included. And his name is associated with one of the biggest mass graves that I had visited in 2008, 2009. And this guy is still driving through the streets of Baghdad and positioning himself now as a philanthropist, as a charity worker, giving people salaries and frozen chicken. And, and he laughs about it. And he laughs about these kind of stories. And the end of this tour, he takes me to this car park and he shows me this almost dozen armored pickup trucks he had looted from the Iraqi army and says, I'm keeping them for the day that I might need them. So this guy, a killer, is still there driving the street. But in a way, he is authentic to his militia commander self. Others have progressed and are now part of the parliament, run militias, which has a state uh, security cover. They have uh, economical empires. They siphoned around 20 to 30 percent of the state budget. This is the term we're not accountable. When you go to Iraq now and you ask the Iraq, so what do you think of America war and something? The first thing they will tell you, and this is the one thing that all Iraqis agree on, is you protest this corrupt clique of kleptocratic politicians who installed them, installed them here. This is where the Iraqis now have an issue with the United States. You know, the war is gone. It's been 20 years. The victims, the civilians, all these things are gone. But the point where people blame the United States about is enabling this political system that we have now in Iraq. As you say in your book, the new state whose army was trained and equipped by the Americans while its generals and commanders served Iranian interests maintained the ethos of violence, torture, and killings inherited from the leader necessity. That would be Saddam. Torture in particular became the central pillar of its collective security mentality shared among a wide range of militias, military units, and intelligence services. You also say on this page, a state was created that had all the trappings of a liberal democracy, elections, free press, parliament, a free market, and yet its lethargic, inflated administration wrapped in archaic bureaucratic rules and regulations and fossilized hierarchies behaves like other Middle Eastern authoritarian regimes. It's a wealthy, oil-exporting country whose citizens live in poverty without employment, an adequate health care system, electricity, or drinking water where sectarian parties and their militias have built statelets of corruption. You know, that term there has stuck with me. Statelets of corruption and fiefdoms of commercial interests within the state and where a new class of the super wealthy have emerged with a panache for spending fortunes 
in nightclubs and private gambling rooms. That is on page 390 of your superb book. So I bring that up because how can anyone say that Iraq is a democracy today? Iraq is not a democracy today. While the Constitution guarantees a freedom of expression, the new political parties or these political parties are going back to the penal code of Saddam, created in 1969, to use that rulings from that penal code to punish journalists, people who criticize the government. This is the kind of the mutant state we have today. Why do these statelets of corruptions exist? Because that system, that sectarian allocation system created, which we call in Arabic muhasasa, dividing state spoils among the different political parties, gives each party a ministry or institution to run like a private fiefdom. One controls the Ministry of Oil, one controls the Ministry of Health, the other controls the Ministry of whatnot. And they loot from government contract a 5 to 10% per contract, leading to an eventual siphoning of 20 to $30 billion every year from a state budget, which is 100 to $120 billion. So Iraq is wealthy. Iraq could become a decent country for its people. That corruption, in my personal opinion, is as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than terrorism or jihadi militants. The social injustice, sorry, I interrupt. The social injustice you see in Iraq at the moment, that is bound to explode, to lead to another cycle of violence unless it's being dealt with very urgently. Yeah, you said another civil war is possible. Yeah, I mentioned earlier uh, when I was trying to frame a question about the the Sunni divide and the awakening movement. You know, the foreign jihadists have been marginalized. There are still 2,500 U.S. troops in Iraq today to make sure they don't make a comeback. But these internal problems, as you say, are more pressing. Uh, I want to return to what's going on in Iraq today and their new prime minister in a moment. How did you, I want to get back to some of your experiences as a journalist, how did you manage to survive so many encounters with people who could have easily killed you? So that's a very good question. I mean, was it just luck? And I, and I, write, I mean, maybe you were a savvy journalist. You knew the language. You weren't an American walking around like a big American press helmet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at one point, it stopped mattering if you're American with a big press helmet or you're Iraqi carrying a small camera. As long as you're identified with the media, you become a target for kidnapping, for killing. Dozens of Iraqi journalists were killed because of that. However, the point is to find someone you can trust. To, there's always been people who've helped me, who who gave me shelter, who protected me, and who told me the story against their own interests or the interests of their communities. I don't know why they tell the stories, but you know, at one point I was covering the Battle of Mosul for so long that I could witness kind of these human right abuses happening right in front of my eyes by soldiers who were very decent people themselves, but they were so you know, brutalized by this war that they turn as savage as their opponents and they were executing and torturing people right in front of my eyes. So I don't know. It's probably luck, probably. Well, you knew that in some of these situations you might have been killed, right? You went after a story knowing full well it might be the end for you. I did. I did. And and I was lucky. I mean, in other places and other countries, I wasn't so lucky. I was detained, kidnapped a couple of times in Afghanistan and, and, and Libya. Wow. But so far, I mean, <laughs> has been. And some of the people yeah. you interviewed, uh, some of the characters, if you will, disappeared, never to be seen again. Yes, yes. This uh, all must have taken a toll on you as a human being, is I guess what I'm getting at. I mean, look, one of the most horrible scenes that I will never forget, I was in Beirut and I woke up and I looked at the, on my on my phone to check the news the first thing you do in the morning. And I see this picture on Facebook of this corpse on the back of a pickup truck. And I read the comments that this is a Iraqi journalist translator called Alan. And Alan was a childhood friend of mine. And and he was killed. He was he was ambushed with an American journalist. She was kidnapped and he was killed. And that you know, that is that is not a conflict that you're covering. That is not a car bomb that you see and a bunch of strange. This is your friend who ends up as a corpse in the back of a pickup truck. These are the stories that will keep haunting me, I would say. 
According to the Brown University Costs of War Project, in Iraq, 282 journalists and media workers were killed. Another 75 in Syria and ISIS-controlled territory. So that's a total of 357 people in our profession who were killed in, in violence. About ISIS... The narrative here, the partisan narrative in the United States was after President Obama withdrew, per the status of forces agreement with the Iraqi government, withdrew the final American troops in 2011. Well, that allowed ISIS to rise and take over huge swaths of territory, including Mosul. A few hours ago, I spoke with Iraqi Prime Minister Maliki. I reaffirmed that the United States keeps its commitments. He spoke of the determination of the Iraqi people to forge their own future. We are in full agreement about how to move forward. So, today, I can report that, as promised, the rest of our troops in Iraq will come home by the end of the year. After nearly nine years, America's war in Iraq will be over. But the catalyst for that insurgency was the wrongdoing of the Shia government, right? I would say I don't think the Americans, if they had stayed or left, would have made a difference. ISIS was the result of the dynamic, the sectarian dynamics first created in Iraq after 2003, hyped through the during the days of the Arab Spring, the uprising in Syria. The sectarian rhetoric that was prevalent in Iraq that crossed the border into Syria. And what started as a popular uprising soon descended into the civil war. There was chaos on the border region or lawlessness, basically. No one controlled that border region between Syria and Iraq. So the defeated jihadi insurgency, Al-Qaeda, that was defeated in 2008-9, went to Syria to reconstruct itself. They came back to Iraq benefiting from the sectarian policies of Nur al-Maliki. Nur al-Maliki, instead of using this, what I call the interregnum, and this period between the two civil wars, to reach out to the Sunnis, to bring them back into government, to end the discrimination against the Sunni population, Nur al-Maliki and his, and other kind of political parties aligned to him, No, they continued into their oppression. The Sunnis tried to mimic the Arab Spring by having these demonstrations in in Ramadi and other Sunni towns. And of course, the jihadis and other insurgents took advantage of it and Mosul fell. Another factor here, very important. Mosul fell, although there was tens of thousands of Iraqi troops, Mosul fell to gangs of hundreds of men on pickup trucks while there were battalions of Iraqi army, special forces, police, with billions worth of equipment. Why did they collapse and fall? And this is an American equipped and trained army. It collapsed because the army was so corrupt, thanks to, again, to Nur al-Maliki, because army officers got their jobs by buying their posts and bribing the higher-ups. A battalion would have, on paper, 200 men. In reality, 50 were only serving, again, because of corruption. So the fall of Mosul had many fathers. Sounds like what happened in Afghanistan, ghost soldiers, corruption. I mean, it's apparent to me that Iraq is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. I mean, there's a lot of countries that go into that category. The corruption shows up in so many different ways because of the vacuum of state legitimacy, if you want to put it that way. One example you give is how, well, it was was an anecdote that you share near the end of your book. Uh, A woman is explaining to you how this one young man disappeared. So Mosul is liberated, if you want to use that word, by Iraqi Shia forces, I guess. It was the Iraqi army along with some Shia militias. They get rid of ISIS. And now it's time to settle scores. Anyone who was suspected of being a member of ISIS is basically disappeared. And this one young man, you know, somebody points the finger at him. He was a member of ISIS. He's trying to hide his identity. He disappears. His family never sees him again. And they had to pay bribes to the government, the the local forces, the local authorities there, just to get his body back. Thousands and thousands of dollars. Actually, at first, right, they thought he might still be alive. And then they're told, sorry, he's been dead for six months. These are heartbreaking stories, but the corruption was everywhere. 
And the corruption is still everywhere, Martin. If you go to any police station in Iraq, just choose a town, put your finger in, go to that police station, go to the police station as a witness, get arrested for a day, and you will see the torture. And this torture has, is not limited to people who are accused of being members of ISIS, people who are criminals or something. Any police station in Iraq is a source of generating income. They beat you up until you pay for the beating to stop. You pay for the food. You pay to get your mobile buy. These are the security services that share the legacy of torture from before 2003, but also these are security forces that are so corrupt that it's unbelievable that it's what war does to the fabric of a society. What you just said there reminded me of something Antony Beaver, the great war historian, wrote in his book about the Spanish Civil War. And before the Civil War started, people would greet each other on buses and you were just a, a fellow Spaniard. Then after the war, you weren't a fellow Spaniard anymore. You were from this part of the country or you were this faction. Your humanity was gone. You were simply an other, the other. And that sounds like what's happened in Iraq, but also just rank corruption too, right? These are people that can be exploited. They're powerless. That division of the state, you know, suddenly you're no longer Iraqi, but you are from that tribe, from that city. That prevailed, I would say, until the fall of Mosul or after the liberation of Mosul. After the liberation of Mosul, a new Iraqi identity started emerging a kind of transsectarian identity mainly shared by the youth who suddenly recaptured the narrative. Uh, they're waving they Iraqi flags, right? The Iraqi flag gained a new symbolism because ISIS was such a horrible thing. It's basically unified the people for the first time. So the Sunnis who suffered from ISIS atrocities and the Shia who fought against ISIS. And then that national identity, national and not in the, let's call it patriotic identity, not national. That patriotic identity led to one of the most positive manifestations in Iraqi history the past 20 years, which is the uprising in 2019, the youth uprising, when people, tens of thousands pulled into the streets and the rallying cry was, we want a homeland, we want a country. And it was a uprising or demonstrations against the corruption of the, of the ruling parties. I want to return to a question I asked before, one of my meandering maze-like questions. We're going to return to it now. Uh, the ICC just charged Vladimir Putin. I mentioned before about how I used to think of the leaders of my own country as of having committed war crimes. Do you agree with that? Of course they committed war crimes. But, you know, one of the victims of this war in Iraq for 20 years, the victim is ideas like justice the independence of the press, credibility of the press, and also democracy itself. People like Putin, Bashar al-Assad, and all other kind of strong men and dictators in the region, in the country, in the world, can point to what the Americans said and use it as a justification to what they're saying. And of course, they are using it as a justification. And this is a big problem. I try to explain to other Iraqis, you know, what's happening in Ukraine is atrocious. We've all been through wars. We've all been through illegal occupation. So that is bad. One bad thing does not justify the other. But they do it. They do it. You know, people like Bashar and Putin, they will point at America and say, why? You know, because they lost credibility a long time ago. And, and that is a problem. The same issue with democracy. You know, democracy is another victim of the war of the past 20 years, because you go to young Iraqis and you say, what do you think of the parliament or elections? And they instantly will equate parliament, members of parliament with corruption, with kind of striking deals and that. Thing. All these concepts have been victim of this war. So it's not only the Iraqi people who were killed and are victim of this war, but ideas that America believes itself in propagating like, I don't know, international justice and democracy. Sorry to be name dropping here, but I, I'm also thinking about a book I read uh, some years ago by Svetlana Alexievich about the post-Soviet Russia. She was interviewing people who remembered the Soviet Union and then all the hopes in the early 1990s about capitalism and democracy, right? And how, of course, it didn't work out for them. People lost their savings. They lost their jobs. And it did not seem like it was worth it. And some of them pined for the days of the Soviet Union. Yeah, they were poor, but at least they had work. Do you meet Iraqis who wish they could go back to the 1980s or the pre-1990s? <laughs> 
not to name drop two, but uh, Alexievich's work is has a huge influence in my and in what I try to oh, do wow. in this book. The problem with chaos, civil wars, it it makes the people yearn for the strong man, for the dictator, for the quote unquote the just dictator, because they say, look, at least in the days of Saddam, we had security. Now we don't have security, and this is a it's, it's a disaster. You know, it's a disaster. People kind of have a very short memory, and they don't see that Saddam is partly responsible for the chaos that we are in today. But because there is so much chaos, because there are so many militias in the street, and there's so much violence that leads the people people to think that if only we had one violent man rather than a dozen violent uh, commanders and militia commanders. Yeah, you never know who your enemy is during a civil war. And as you describe it, I mean, there are death squads going around, yanking people out of their houses who did nothing wrong. Wow. So final question. We'll go back to what's happening in Iraq today. The newish prime minister there, after a very long period trying to form a government, Mohammed Shia al-Sudani, one of his vows is to fight corruption. Uh, he recently met with top U.S. leaders, uh, I believe it was, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, made an unannounced trip to Iraq. So what does that tell you about security in Iraq if American leaders can only go there unannounced? We're deeply committed to ensuring that the Iraqi people can live in peace and dignity, with safety and security, and with economic opportunity for all. Our defense cooperation against Daesh is a key pillar of our bilateral relationship. Most people don't in the United States don't know who he is. What can you say about him? So he seems like a decent man. I mean, he was not one of the exiles. He was a person who grew up in Iraq, saw the suffering of Iraq, saw the thing. But with all his good intentions, the fact is, can he achieve anything? He is not a weak person, but weak politically. He's a compromised prime minister brought to power by the same political parties that siphon the wealth of the state. Can a single man and, and I assure you, the whole Iraq population will be standing behind him if he puts any, a single one of those mafia bosses behind bars. But the, the problem is corruption is so enshrined in the state. I mean, the prime minister before him also tried to do these things. Two prime ministers ago, also they tried to do these things. Every prime minister comes with these pledges to end corruption, to fight, restore the dignity of the state, have monopoly on the use of violence, but then they all fail because, I don't want to call it a deep state or a parallel state, but these statelets of corruption are so deep into the Iraqi society or, or into the Iraqi political system. He has defended the presence of U.S. troops in the country. He has invited them to stay. Is that a popular position in Iraq? Look, the issue of American forces in Iraq is like it's been used by all these, let's call them, pro-Iranian forces in Iraq. It's been used again and again as this reason to maintain their own weapons, to say that we are a resistance to the occupiers. And as long as the occupiers are in the country, we'll continue to carry our resistance. But all the Iraqi government, even those who have members of these pro-Iranian forces within them, they know they cannot maintain a very secure defense system without the Americans there. So it's a paradox. I mean, they have F-16s that they need the Americans to maintain, but then if the Americans are not there, so they cannot fly their F-16. And, and, and that's, the, again, the legacy of Iraq 20 years later. They they have this very weird relationship with the Americans. You know, we hate you, we hate you, but we need you, we need you. We hate you, we need you. That, I think, 20 years later, neither Iraq nor America has still managed to come out of that horrible mad relationship they had 20 years ago. But you know the funny factor? You know, who are the people who are desperate for the Americans to stay? It's the Sunni people and the Ramadi and Fallujah and all these places that fought hard against the Americans because now they see the Americans as a, you know, as a protection against a total Iranian takeover of the country. You believe we will be greeted as liberators. I've talked with a lot of, uh, of Iraqis in the last several months myself, uh, had them to the White House. The President and I have met with them, with various groups and individuals, uh, people who've devoted their lives from the outside to trying to change things inside Iraq. Men like Kanan Makia, who's a, a professor at Brandeis, but an Iraqi, he's written great books about the subject, knows the country intimately, has 
a part of the democratic opposition and resistance. Um, the read we get on the people of Iraq is there's no question but what they want to get rid of Saddam Hussein, and they will welcome as liberators the United States. On the next episode of History As It Happens, one consequence of the U.S. failures in the Middle East is that the country's influence there has waned, U.S. hegemony on the wane. That has opened a door for China to make inroads on the diplomatic front as it has helped broker a peace deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. We're going to be joined by Trita Parsi to discuss that and more as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 